Hi guys. So in today's reading, there is going to be some very shocking news that's going to change the course of the story. It may seem like there's something in just about every chapter, but so far this tops them all. You might want to grab a box of tissues. You might want to grab a box of tissues. Are you ready? Let's get reading. Chapter 22, The Black Book. Wow, was Dr. Kramer going to be surprised today? With all that had happened since her last appointment, it was probably going to be enough to send him back to the hospital. The vision she had seen in his office, the flood and Wes's accident, the proof that Ezra was real and he was now leaving, her engagement that she was trying to make temporary, and, oh yeah, Gia was coming home tomorrow. Gia didn't know about any of this. Maybe if she did, she'd rather stay in South America. She would think Celeste was nuts for devising a plan to put off her engagement. Besides, she had never met Ezra, and it would be difficult for her to understand Celeste's feelings about the entire situation. Dr. Kramer might understand. It was his job to do so. Celeste hoped that she could convince Dr. Kramer to agree with her that marriage would not be in her best interest right now. Celeste would need to complete all of her therapy and then go through a trial period to ensure that she was well enough to handle a marriage. Surely Wes would understand that delaying wedding plans was the best option. It wouldn't be fair for him to begin a marriage with all of her issues. But of course, if it were Ezra who had proposed, sadly, things would be much different. He felt the same way about her that she felt about him. She could see it and feel it every time he was near. Celeste believed that marrying Ezra would be exactly what the doctor ordered. The way he made her feel always helped her forget about her problems. Marrying Ezra would guarantee a lifetime of free therapy. Better yet, she would be instantly healed. That was something she would keep to herself. She would delay this engagement as long as she possibly could in hopes to leave a door open for a miracle to occur. As she walked into the building, the fear and panic following last week's appointment still seemed to linger around. There was a heavy sadness in the air as if Dr. Kramer's heart attack had just barely happened. Celeste glanced down the hall as the haunting scene so fresh in her mind played out again in her head. The adrenaline in her blood as she ran to his office. The agony on Dr. Kramer's face as he fell to the floor. The voice of the 911 operator trying to keep her calm. The beautiful apparition of the lovely woman in the lavender dress. The sounds of the sirens and the flashing red and blue lights outside the window. The fear on Jean's face. A full week hadn't even passed since that day, and here she was coming to see him. It was a little strange that Dr. Kramer had wanted to keep her appointment today, especially her parents right after. Their situation wasn't urgent at all. Oh well, if he was feeling up to it, then who was she to argue? Jean hadn't noticed Celeste yet as she was on a phone call. Her back was facing Celeste, her head hung low, and her voice was quiet. It must have been a hard week having to reschedule all of Dr. Kramer's appointments. With one less therapist on duty, traffic was probably much slower than usual, and Jean most likely had much more free time to worry about Dr. Kramer and express her concerns. All right, we'll talk to you later, Jean said as she hung up the phone. A look of surprise came over her face as she turned around to see Celeste standing at the desk. Oh, sweetheart, there's not going to be an appointment today, she said with tear-stained eyes. I knew this would be too soon. What was Dr. Kramer thinking? Celeste awkwardly joked, with no luck of yielding so much as a smile or laugh from Jean. Jean took off her glasses and wiped her eyes with her fingers. I'm sorry, I should have called you yesterday, but with all that's happened, I've been a basket case. What happened? Celeste asked, unsure if she wanted to hear the answer. Dr. Kramer passed away yesterday afternoon in the hospital from heart rupture. Celeste gasped, covering her mouth in shock. I still don't understand it. He was doing so well. 
They had just released him Tuesday morning. Then I got a phone call from the hospital yesterday morning that he had been readmitted for chest pain. I rushed right over and was able to see him for just a few minutes before they wheeled him into surgery. What did he say? Celeste asked, trying to hold back her emotions. He told me if he didn't survive, there was something I was to give you. Me? Yes. In fact, while you're here, come with me and I'll get it from his office. What about his family, his wife and children? How are they doing? Oh, honey, did he not tell you? Jean asked with a very sympathetic look as she placed her hand against her chest. Tell me what? Do you remember the infamous lakeside murders from a few years ago? They made national headlines. I think so. Yes, that was Dr. Kramer's family. His wife and children were brutally tortured and murdered in their own home. He came home and found them hours after it happened. In fact, for months he was considered a suspect, until the real suspects were brought forward and tried. They were found guilty and sentenced. That's why Dr. Kramer moved here. He couldn't stay in that house and in that town. He came here for healing and a new start. Bless his sweet soul. I... I had no idea, Celeste said as she followed Jean down the hall to Dr. Kramer's office. Well, that was Walter for you, always leading on as though everything was peachy keen. You never would have guessed what he had been through unless he would have told you. Such as a wonderful man he was. As Jean opened the office door, Celeste could not believe the news about Dr. Kramer. She had just been in this very office only days ago, talking about her next appointment. And now there would be no more next appointments. It was a sad and eerie feeling. Celeste followed Jean over to the desk where she began rummaging through the drawers. The pictures of Dr. Kramer's wife and children sat in a timeless position. All this time, Celeste had imagined Dr. Kramer going home to his family after a long day's work. To think that instead, he went home to an empty house was heartbreaking. No wonder he spent so much time at the office. There was nothing to go home to. Here it is. This must be it, Jean said as she pulled out a black leather notebook. My dear, I'm not even going to open it. It's just not my place to pry. She handed the notebook to Celeste. I don't understand, Celeste said as she took the notebook. What is this? Dr. Kramer was a very private and lonely man. I believe this is how he released his thoughts and feelings, to maintain his sanity. When he was released from the hospital, he came straight here to his office. I came by to check on him and found him writing in this book. He seemed to be in such a cheerful mood. Then the next morning, I got the call and rushed over to see him. He told me that I needed to find this book and give it to you, if he didn't survive. I knew for him to be talking that way, his condition must be very serious. I don't know that I can take something like this, Celeste hesitated. I mean... I'm not even family. My dear, he didn't have any family. In fact, I don't know what we are going to do with all of his things. There's no one to send them to. No emergency contacts. It's such a sad situation. Really it is. Celeste glanced over again at the picture of his wife and children sitting by the lake. How happy he must be right now to be reunited with them. There was nothing to be sad about. She envisioned Dr. Kramer's face in the picture next to his wife, the beautiful woman with long, dark hair in the lavender dress. Celeste's eyes widened in complete surprise. It was her, the woman who administered to Dr. Kramer while Celeste was on the phone with 911. It was really her. I'm in the process of rescheduling all of Walter's appointments with the other therapists in the building. I will call you as soon as I have it figured out. Jean closed the door and locked it as she escorted Celeste back to the lobby. I may not need to reschedule, Celeste said as she held the book close to her chest. Something tells me that everything I need is in this book. 
I hope so, sweetheart. I really hope you find what you need. Celeste thanked Jean and waved goodbye to her as she reached for her phone to call her parents. This wasn't going to be easy telling them the news. All she could think about was getting home as quickly as she could, hiding away in her room for the rest of the day, and reading the book she held in her hands. The book that was important enough to Walter to mention on his deathbed. The book that held his private thoughts and feelings. But most of all, the book that contained his last words. Her last appointment wasn't over yet. Not until she finished the book. Later that evening. Honey, are you okay? You've been in there for a couple hours now and your father and I are starting to get worried. Really, Mom, I'm fine. I just need some time to think and be alone. Take all the time you need, but I hope you'll join us for dinner. It's brisket tonight. I'll be down, don't worry. Celeste was getting closer to the last five pages. She held on to her bed sheet and continued to wipe her eyes. There was so much more to Dr. Kramer than she had realized. This journey of his from picking up the pieces of a destroyed life and moving on was more heart-wrenching than she had expected. Each journal entry was just as raw as the one before. His words were that of a man trying to make sense of a world he had no control over. They were hauntingly sincere with traces of pain and remorse. She turned the page and continued on reading. June 6th. 2012. Dear Jay, it's been a while since I last wrote, but I feel the need to tell you about an experience I had today. As you know, I try to keep my profession separate from my personal life, but the thoughts that have been running through my mind today warrant further exploration. I know that whatever I tell you stays confidential, which is why I'm writing to you about this matter. This is risky, but in my field, I am always doing the listening, so I look forward to these opportunities to be on the other end. In my line of work, there is only so much I can record in a patient's file to keep within the standards and regulations of my profession. Beyond that, everything is pure speculation, curiosity and my own personal assumptions, which I must be careful to keep separate and private. However, I feel that by discussing these with you, it may help me shed some light on the areas I tend to overlook. There's a new client that came in today, and by all means, she is a very attractive young woman, which makes her story even more compelling. You see, she has mentioned some bizarre experiences that open up an entire new area of possibilities to consider. Some would argue that a psychiatry facility might have suited her well over the past few years, but I don't believe that's the correct path. In fact, I have become so used to the typical abuse, depression, anxiety, and trauma issues that come in and out of my office each day that I was completely caught off guard by her unexpected afflictions, unexplained phenomenon, telepathy, and as strange as it may sound, psychic abilities. Celeste looked at the date of the entry. It was the day of her first appointment. He must have been referring to her. She continued on reading. It pains me to say that I know so little about this area of study, which also fascinates me. I've been toying with the idea today of expanding my knowledge on parapsychology, which would of course make me a laughing stock amongst my colleagues. Because of that, I most likely will keep this under wraps. Between you and me, I can't afford to discredit my reputation by any means. Just like politics and religion, it's a matter best kept to oneself. Over the next week, I plan to expand on the details of my research, findings, theories and conclusions with my new client. I feel that attaching a summary of my notes will help make the picture a little clearer. Because of time restrictions, I could only collect so much information today. Believe me, there is much more than meets the eye here. After only scratching the surface today, I am anxious to dig deep at our next appointment. I get the feeling this will be an incredible experience and has opened my mind up to a whole new area of study. We'll keep you posted, Walter.
It was delightful to know that Celeste was important enough to Dr. Kramer to write about his personal journal. She couldn't wait to read more. July 9th, 2012 Dear Jay, Thank you for allowing me to share this intriguing case with you. Since I wrote last, additional components have made their way to the table, and things are getting very interesting. Today was very unusual indeed, as I implemented a session of hypnotherapy with my client. Having only been our fourth appointment, this is the first time I have applied hypnosis this early in a case. I was hoping that by doing so, it would allow me to open up some closed memories of my client so that I could better help her battle her demons. Really, I thought that all it would accomplish was discovering some unfortunate experiences from childhood, such as abuse or the witnessing of a horrific tragedy. As you know, the more relaxed a client is, the more non-threatening the environment becomes and the more he or she is willing to disclose. Our session today seemed to fit that scenario perfectly. As I mentioned to you before, my client is very coherent and sensible. Her ESP abilities and paranormal experiences have led me to speculate that there is an additional element of psychosis at play here. I have reviewed her tests from previous doctors within the last two years, and I see no reason to conclude that her sanity is in any way abnormal. She is intelligent, social, and high-functioning on just about every level. I also don't believe she is fabricating any aspect of her story. It all appears to be very real to her. At the same time, I am not one to believe in the supernatural. And it seems that it is the very thing that my client is implying in regards to her experiences and encounters. Dr. Kramer really had believed her. He didn't think she was crazy. Celeste smiled as she read the paragraph again and then continued on. While under hypnosis today, she began to speak of things I cannot make sense of. At first, she described experiences that I am already aware of such as inadequate feelings in regards to her parents, and becoming alienated in her fears and suffering. Then a complete curveball came when she began to talk about a meeting that involved some type of election. I had asked her to go back earlier in her life, and I can't make sense of her being involved in a type of political voting process during childhood. She spoke about some type of civil war, people being exiled and then seeking vengeance. She spoke of a special mission she is on and tools that were given to her, such as her ESP abilities. I'm telling you, Jay, that this is something that you would only see in a movie, not in the real world, in a real professional practice. I can't wrap my head around it. I've been watching the video over and over again all evening long. If I allow my mind to wander, I can't help but envision some type of cultic experience she may have been referring to. I don't believe I should dismiss it, but I'm unsure how to dissect and analyze it. I have asked that she bring her parents to our next appointment in hopes that they can shed some light. Worst case scenario, I expose some horrid family secret or they use it as more reason to make false assumptions about their daughter. A family secret? Why didn't he mention this to her? This was the real reason he had invited her parents to come meet with him. What did he think about her family? Despite how they may react, I feel it's necessary that they understand what their daughter is going through and how they have unknowingly influenced her suffering and fear. I see her potential and such a bright future. If she can resolve whatever it is that is plaguing her well-being, it is my goal to help her do so. I think that the reason I am so passionate about this client is that she reminds me a great deal of Shannon. Shannon was his wife. Dr. Kramer had written about her many times throughout his journal. She was a beautiful woman, and Celeste felt honored to be compared to her. Something about her mannerisms and character, it's almost uncanny. I see the wonderful qualities in her that are so much like Shannon's, and I want to bring those to surface. In fact, I do have a confession to make. Lately, I find myself having these unexplained feelings for her. Celeste couldn't believe her eyes. Dr. Kramer had feelings for her? He was a very handsome man, 
and at times she was nervous at how he might judge her to think that all this time he actually had feelings for her. Celeste couldn't help but to laugh, not in an inappropriate sense, but more on a level of deep care and concern. Yes, she is beautiful, and yes, she is single, but she is also my client. This has never happened to me before, and it's added a bit of a wrench in the wheel on my end. You can rest assured, however, that I am not willing to take advantage in any way of my role as her therapist or overstep any professional boundaries. I really hope that by involving her parents and trying to make sense of what she told me today, that I am not opening up a Pandora's box here. But if I am, that I'm prepared to deal with any consequences that may arise. I am committed to helping my client to whatever extent that may entail. Jay, I will keep you posted on this case over the course of our appointments. Sincerely, Walter. Dr. Kramer really was a good man. He truly was invested in helping Celeste no matter what the cost. To think that he was gone now saddened her soul. She would never find a therapist like him again. She was quite confident of that. As she continued on through the next couple of entries, she began to learn things about herself that she had never realized before. It was as though Dr. Kramer had seen some kind of potential in her and was determined to pull it out. He emphasized her good qualities and stressed why they were so important and how they could help her overcome her challenges. He laid out a blueprint of how she could use these qualities, what she deemed as her weaknesses, as tools to better her life. This was amazing. Was this what he wanted to talk with her about today? Why was this so important that he was willing to risk his health to come meet with her. She continued reading on until the answer fell upon her like a ton of bricks. July 26, 2012. Dear Jay, something indescribable has happened to me. I really don't know how or where to begin, but I'm so euphoric that my hands are shaking and I can barely hold this pen. Friday afternoon, I was meeting with the client I have been telling you about. It was a great appointment, and I was able to meet with her parents. It felt as though we gained some great headway. I don't feel that I have been under any unusual stress lately, but for some reason, I felt my chest hurting. At first, I felt as though it may have been heartburn from lunch, but as it persisted, I knew it was more serious. I waited for my client and her parents to leave so that I didn't have to worry or trouble them. I was simply going to take an aspirin and lie down to wait out the pain, but before I could get up and out of my chair, I began to feel dizzy and lightheaded. When I realized what might be happening, I felt sheer panic set in and thought I might be having a serious panic attack. I couldn't breathe and my body started to feel numb. Life felt as though it were slipping away from me and there was nothing I could do about it. My strength and energy had failed me, and all I could do was collapse to the floor. When I hit the floor, I started to rise up, but I noticed that my body was still on the floor. I wondered if this might be a dream. Then I looked over and saw my client rush in to find me this way. When I saw the look on her face and heard her call 911, I figured this must be really happening. For the first time, I felt free of my burdens. The weight of having a body and all the emotional and physical pain that goes with it had been lifted. I felt wonderful. I tried yelling to her that I was okay, but she couldn't hear or see me. In that split second, I heard a voice call my name. I turned to see a glowing bright light at the doorway. As it grew closer, I recognized the voice of the woman. I saw that it was Shannon. Her mouth was not moving, but she was calling my name. She was more beautiful than I remember her being, and she smiled at me in a welcoming way. My heart leaped with joy as I rushed over to sweep her off the ground, but she stopped me. She told me that I could not touch her. Not yet. She said that it was not quite my time to be with her and that, she had come to convince me to stay. When I realized that I had a choice to stay or to go with her, all I wanted to do was to go with her. I told her how lonely I have been 
and how much I desire to be with her. She bent down and began to resuscitate my body. I asked her why she was doing this and begged her to stop, and it was then she showed me a vision of some sort. I saw a scene playing out before me. It was a scene from the future. I saw the most amazing things come to pass in world events and here in America. I then saw things that saddened me to my very core. World chaos, civil unrest, which all led to and resulted from an unexpected war. I saw disease break out and ravage this country, killing about two-thirds of the population almost overnight. I saw earthquakes, fires, flooding, and destruction. I saw parents murdering children and children murdering parents, as those who survived the disease were now facing starvation and famine. I saw government fall apart, as other countries stepped in pretending to offer aid, but in reality were trying to take over. It was a horrific sight to see, and I asked for it to stop. Then I saw my client. I saw that she had an amazing role in all of this. She was going to change the world. Not that she could stop these events from happening, but she could assist in a monumental way. When I saw what it was that she was going to do, my heart again jumped for joy. I knew that the reason I had stayed behind all this time was to help steer her in the direction she was to go. That was my work that I needed to finish. I now understood why I could not be with Shannon yet, and I allowed her to revive my body. Shannon told me that I had made a good choice, and that when I returned to my body, it was important that I write down what I had seen. She said that I would see her again very soon, and to endure the challenges ahead as best as I could. Before I could say goodbye, I felt my spirit being sucked like a vacuum back into my body. It was the most painful experience I have ever encountered. My body felt as though it were being pricked with hundreds of needles from head to toe. I felt intense pressure in my abdomen, and I couldn't move. Before I knew it, paramedics had arrived, and from that point on, I don't remember anything until waking up in the hospital. When I woke up, I wondered if what I had experienced was at all real. It was all I could think about. Soon, Jean was allowed to come in and she told me what had happened. Everything she explained was exactly what I had seen. It was incredible. Jean couldn't understand why I was so happy. She must have thought I was just happy to be alive. But the truth is, I knew that what had happened to me was real. I knew that there was life after death. I knew that what I had experienced went against everything I did, or I should say didn't, believe before. This knowledge gave me hope, and for some reason, I felt free. I knew that Shannon existed and that she was happy. That meant that my children existed and were being taken care of. I knew I would see them again. I felt like a kid on Christmas morning. Furthermore, knowing all of this completely changed the way I viewed my job. It will forever change the way I do my job. I can't wait to meet with my client again and tell her. I want to thank her for coming back to check on me and for calling 911. I know that Shannon showed her my situation and urged her to run to me. I realize now how the other world has such a big role in everything we do here in this life. Our loved ones watch over us and protect us. They guide us to where we need to be and they show us what to do. How often we think it was just a coincidence, luck, or our own idea. But really, it was not. I don't know how much time I have left here on this earth, but I feel a sense of urgency in sharing what I know with the world. The thought of tainting my professional reputation is of no concern to me. I know what I saw and felt. I know it was real. I feel happier than I did on my wedding day, and I can't wait to get back to work. Celeste turned the page, only to realize that there was nothing more. Those had been Dr. Kramer's last words. They pierced her soul with gratitude and a desire to know more. What he had written would change her life in ways she couldn't understand. Dr. Kramer had done his part in helping Celeste prepare for her role in what lie ahead, and now he was again with his family. 
As she closed the black book, she held it to her chest and sank down into her pillow. She looked up at the ceiling and tried to imagine Dr. Kramer in a wonderful place with his beautiful wife and children. The thought of it was so peaceful and serene. Celeste! Her quiet thoughts were interrupted by a loud knock from her mother at the bedroom door. Gia's mother is here to see you. It's urgent, honey. I think you need to come quick. And that's it for today's chapter. Join me next week as we read chapter 23 in Hot Pursuit.